I'll get to that in just a second. For when we start the Renaissance, assuming we finish Wife of Bath today, if we finish Wife of Bath today, I think we will, we'll have a Middle, uh, middle English exam on Thursday, which means a week from today we'll start the Renaissance and we're so screwed for time. Um, I want you to read all the sonnets that I have on this syllabus, but pay special attention or focus on numbers 2, 18, 20, 30, 73, 116, 129, 130, and 144, which, are, which is only nine of them. Um, there aren't that many more on the syllabus. I mean, there's maybe, maybe nine more, I think. Right? So focus on these. These are what we will try to cover in maybe one day. Don't think I'll get to all of them. Um, I will definitely do... those in class. <clears throat> Just a little note to myself. Okay. So, because I'm going to, I'm going to drop the stuff about the Bible, which is only 13 pages uh, in terms of reading, but we, we don't, won't have time to discuss it. Um, and I'll make other changes as we uh, go along. So if, if you read the prologue and then you read her tale, what's, what is one interesting thing about the two in relation? Okay. What is the purpose of a prologue? I'm going to give you a sense of the story of what happened. Set it up at the very least. It sets it up. It's an introduction of sorts. Are prologues usually longer than the thing that they're proing? No. no, they're not. The prologue is twice as long as the tale. All right. What does she talk about in her prologue? How many of you read the prologue? I mean, throw that out first. Maybe one of you. Okay. She talks about her previous husbands, or she talks about her husbands, her marital relationships. And all to what purpose? Well, the purpose is the purpose of the tale. That is, she talks about her previous relationships to lead to the tale she's going to tell. And this is an example of something that Chaucer does throughout the Canterbury Tales. He does this with every one of the characters who um, is given a voice to actually tell a tale. He fits the teller to the tale. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start, for example, even though you didn't read it, The Knight's Tale. The Knight's Tale was the first one. What kind, of, what kind of story would you expect a knight, first estate, highest member of society, to tell? Something about war, right? Something, okay, possibly about war. It's very well articulated. It's, it's well expressed, okay. What else? Like chivalry, and chivalry, courtly love. He nails it. That is, he tells us a tale of romance. Romance doesn't necessarily mean boy-girl love. Romance implies, yes, there is a erotic love element to it. But it also implies some kind of martial component. That is, as... Um, sorry, brain dead. There is a um, word, martial, military aspect to it, Okay. What else is there? There's often some kind of supernatural element. Okay? 
in, in the case of the Knight's Tale, you've got the gods involved. There, there's your supernatural aspect, okay? So the knight would be familiar with that. Why? Because we read the Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and we get, you know, everything that that tale emphasizes is kind of for a courtly audience. Well, after the Knight's Tale, we get the Miller's Tale, okay? What were we told about the Miller in the, in the general introduction? Thumb of gold, which means he's a crook, okay? Mm -hmm. He's kind of base, he's common, he's ordinary, but he's also a crook. And so what the, Knights, what the Miller's Tale does, and the reason the Miller goes second is because he's drunk and interrupts, okay? Is the Miller listens to the Knight's Tale, we can update, you know, our communities, if you want. And you could say the knight is the 1%, and the miller represents the 99%. And he's tired of the 1% getting it all, so he takes the 1%'s tale, the kind of story the 1% love, and he turns it on its head. And you get what's called a burlesque, or also a fabliau. That is, he takes that tale of high-minded romance, where two men fall in love for the fair Emilia, and they fight it out because that's how a woman is won, you know, property, possession, all that kind of stuff, and, you know, etc. okay? So the miller takes that tale, and he turns it on its head so that you do have a woman. She's young. She's beautiful. Her name is Allison, which, by the way, what is the wife of Bath's name? Alice. It's given in the prologue to her tale. Right? Um, also sometimes called Allison. You have this young woman. She's married to an old geezer. So she's like 18, 20, and he's like 70. And it's not because he's rich. Right? She's married to this old man. He doesn't trust her. Good reason in the Middle Ages. Why? Because men, women make cuckolds out of you. They cheat on you all the time because they can't be sexually satisfied. That was the idea in the Renaissance and Middle Ages. So she also has these other suitors, these two other guys, one named Nicholas and one named Absalom, who love her. One of them she loves in return. The other one she does not. Okay? And so we see all these funny little escapades of the one getting in and out of her bed, the husband, yeah, what's that? Not trusting her and everything. And the other one, you know, having bad things happen to him because he's trying to get in and out of her bed. It's another example of the night of Chaucer, excuse me, fitting the tale to the teller. That is, the knight is what kind of, the miller is what kind of person? Does he hang out at court? No, where does he hang out if he hangs out? Bars. Okay? So, we come to the wife of Beth. What have we been told about her in the general prologue? She likes to present herself as holy. She likes to present herself as holy and spiritual and all that kind of stuff. What else are we told? She's gap tooth, which means? She's yeah, go ahead and say it. She's horny. Mm -hmm. She likes sex. She's been married five times. Okay. She's the best weaver. She's the best weaver. She wants people to think high and mighty of her. So, she tells us a tale. What's the tale about? Romance. Well, actually, no, not really romantic. <laughs> it's, really romantic. it's not really romantic. Well, I mean, she tells a tale about, like, a knight of King Arthur who ends up trying to reveal Yeah, I mean, she tells a tale of King Arthur's knights and such. Okay. But the point of her tale follows her prologue. Her prologue's all about her marriages. And what did she get out of each marriage, or in each marriage, if you want? She got the upper hand. Some of her husbands she beat. Others beat her. She tore pages out of the last one's book, who was a clerk, a scholar. Okay. All that leads to this tale. And what is the tale ultimately about? Is it ultimately about Mel Gibson, Helen Hunt, what women want? title of the movie that they both started. in. No, it's not. That's kind of the hook that she hangs the tail on. What is it ultimately about? What is true honor 
or nobility, or the word that Chaucer uses, gentilesa. What is true gentilesa? What does it really mean to be honorable? Or what is real honor? What are the real characteristics of a knight? Is it someone who can do what Sir Gallant does? Go off and lop off heads, kill dragons, rescue maidens, all that kind of stuff. Does it have anything to do with how you're born? Or what family you're born into? So, she begins her tale. Page 345, line 857. Her tale, by the way, is 407 lines long. Her prologue, not including the little words between the Sumner and the wife, her prologue is 828 lines long. Excuse, yeah, 828 lines long. Prologue is twice the length of the tale. And then you get the little part between the Sumner and the, and the Friar, okay? Why do we get that little part? Because the Sumner says, you know, I was thinking of getting married, but hell no. I'm staying away from women after listening to... To that. Yeah, to that, okay? Mm -hmm. So, in the old days of King Arthur, of which the Britons speak great honor, that is great honor, all this land was what? Full of fairies. When King Arthur reigned, fairies were everywhere, behind every rock, every tree, lift a toadstool, there's a fairy, etc. Okay? The elf queen with her jolly company danced full oft in many a green mead, meadow. That's what they did according to medieval stories. I speak of many hundred years ago. Now, she is saying this when? 1380s. So many hundred years ago isn't two. Many is more than four. It's probably five, six, seven. When did King Arthur reign? We didn't know. If King Arthur reigned, we don't know when that was. Well, I'll take that back, we do. Fifth century. Why? Because he fought against the invading Germanic tribes, which started in 450. So, she says, this is the old opinion as I read. I speak many hundred years ago, but now... You can't see elves anymore. Why not? For now, the great charity and prayers of limiters, and you've got a gloss there, friars licensed to preach in a limited area. Well, who just kind of interrupted the prologue? The Sumner and the Friar. So she's kind of going, Ch -ch -ch. she's taking a shot at friars, right? And other holy friars, they search every land and every stream as thick as motes in the sunbeam, and they do what? They go around blessing everything. They bless halls, they bless chambers, they bless kitchens, they bless bowers, that is bedrooms, they bless cities and birds and castles, high towers, they bless throps. What word is that in English today? It's metathesis, the R and the O, reversed. Thorps just means towns. So in England, you got a lot of towns that have the word Thorp on the end. It comes from Old Norse. Those were Viking places. Okay? So Thorps, burns, barns, ships or stables, dairies. Why? Because these fires, these priests are going around and they're blessing everything. So that, you know, if it's a dairy, it'll produce a lot of cheese and milk. If it's a ship, it'll have safe passage, etc. This means, or makes it, what? That there aren't any fairies around. It's kind of like holy water and fairies, they don't mix. So, there aren't any fairies around today. But, there once... Their, their ass want to walk and was an elf. Where there used to be elves walking around, where now walks the limiter himself. In afternoons and mornings, he says his matins, his holy things, his prayers, and he goes around in his little area doing his job. Now, it's implied, women may go safely up and down in every bush or under every tree. Why? 
because there is no other incubus but he, your gloss, a devilish spirit who would appear to women in dreams and thereby impregnate them. That is, a spirit that would have sex with women. And then a succubus is a spirit that would have sex with men. So, feminine spirit having sex with a male, masculine spirit having sex with a female. Place. There is no other succubus but he, and he will not do them but dishonor. Who's the he? The friar. Yeah. Okay. That's another shot. Another little shot at the friar. You know who is a noble post, we're told, unto his order. And so it happened once upon a time during King Arthur's day, we're told, he had a lusty bachelor. Lusty doesn't mean he's out there looking for sex. Lusty means pleasant or pleasing, if you want. Someone who does like pleasure. And on a day, he came riding from a river, and it happened that he was all alone. He saw a maid walking before him. Sound like anybody we've seen before? Who? Longval. Longwell went riding by a river, got off his horse, and he sees two maidens come. Notice, however, Longwell doesn't rape them. Okay? This guy does. He sees a maiden walking in front of him, of which maid immediately, despite her heed, her will, by very force bereft her maidenhead. Remember what the woman, Lady Bertilac, said to Sir Gowan. Oh, we're here and I'm alone. And we're all alone. And, oh, you're such a big, strong, powerful man. And, oh, I'm just a weak woman. And you could force me if you wanted to. And what does he say? Not in my neighborhood, honey. We don't do that back home. You, you may have some weird customs. So this guy does. What's this tell us about him and Arthur's court? The whole Pentecost oath thing. You don't do this. I mean, one of the things they actually swore in the Pentecost oath, don't rape women. Kind of, you know, like it has to be said. If it has to be said, then what does that say happened just previous to that? It will probably happened be. all the time. Okay? So, he rapes her. Word reaches Arthur's court, and we're told, 891, damned was this knight for that deed. By course of law, it was against the law, and he should lose his head. But there was a statute that the queen and the other ladies could essentially intervene so that he wouldn't lose his head. They would determine what happens to him. And we're told, so long prayed the king of grace, that is, of mercy, till he his life him granted in the place and gave him to the queen at her will, that is, at her desire. He's yours, honey. Do with him what you want. Now, if this were the same Guinevere as in Longval, she would probably do with him what she wants and then have him killed. But it's apparently a different Guinevere. And so she thanks King Arthur, and what does she say? We're told, she says, that of thy life yet hast thou no surety. That is no certainty. You deserve to die. But I'll let you live. If what? If you can tell me one thing. What thing is it that women most desire? That's it. Just tell me. What do women most desire? Be, not, not now, because he like starts to open his mouth. Maybe shh, nope. Keep thy neck, I uh, keep thy neck bone from iron. And if you cannot tell it now, I'll give you what? Classic formula in, in Middle English stuff: a year and a day. I'll give you a year and a day. You have a year and a day. Go find out what is it women want, and then come back and tell me. How's he supposed to find out? Does he go borrow the 
clerk of Oxenford's 20 books and read all three, you know, go through the index. What do women want? No. Go seek and learn. Go ask women. If you can give me an answer sufficient in this matter, in surety will I have before you leave thy body for to return in this place. That is, and somebody has to stand in your place. Kind of like bail to make sure you'll return. Woe was this night. And so he sighs. Why? Because he couldn't do what he wanted, which is probably to leave. And at the last, he chooses to go. And so what happens? 919. He seeks every house and every place. Whereas he hopes to find grace. The grace there is probably the answer to his problem to learn what thing women love most. But he never could arrive in no region, whereas he might find in this matter two creatures according in fear or in fear. He couldn't ever find two women who agreed on what women want most. What does he hear? Some said, a925, women love riches. Some said honor. Some said jolliness or jollity. Some said rich array, nice clothing. Some said lust in bed, pleasure in bed. And often time to be widowed and wed. Who does that sound like? The wife of Beth. So he's got a whole bunch of answers, right? So which one does he take to Guinevere? He has no idea which one is right. When that we are flattered and pleased, some said our hearts are most pleased or refreshed. When we're flattered and pleased, he goeth full nigh the truth, I will not lie. That is, that's pretty close. A man shall win us best with flattery and with attendance and with busyness. Busyness. Being busy about her. That is, attending to her desires and such. Been we elimed both more and less. Limed. Limed was used to catch birds. Okay? So she's saying, this is the way to catch us. Some say we love best to be free, to do right as we wish. That is, you might put a ring on me, but it's not a ball and chain. That is, open marriage, okay? And that no man reprove us of our vice. That's sex, by the way. But say that we be wise and nothing foolish. That is, okay, as long as I get you, you know, certain hours of the day, you can go off and do whatever you want and have fun. But there is none of us all, if any person will applaud on the sore, that we will not kick. For he says us true. Try, and he shall find it that so do. For we, we for be we never so vicious within, um, will we be hold, held or considered clean and wise, and clean and sin, clean of sin. Some say, what else? That we like to be held stable and discreet. And in one purpose, steadfastly to dwell and not betray the things that men tell us. But that's not true. Pardi. What does pardi mean? Pardu. By God. We women know nothing, Hella. By God, we women know nothing about how to keep a secret. Okay, keep in mind. Who's telling the story? Chaucer. Yeah. Chaucer. But it's the wife of Beth. But it's Chaucer. It's, this is male's perspective. Okay. So we get the story of Midas. And Chaucer talks about Ovid and such. Um, let's see here. We're going to skip a bit. Pick up back with... 983. 
The snout of which my tail especially, when that he saw he might not come thereby, that is to the answer of what women love most, within his breast he what? He full sorrowful was the ghost, but home he goes. That is, a year has passed, let's say. He's got his day. He doesn't have an answer. Why is he sorrowful in his ghost? Because his ghost is about to leave his body. Ghost just there, just meaning spirit. He goes home. He might not delay. The day was come that homeward must he turn, and in his way it happened him to ride. In all this care under a forest side, and I've said it before, if you're a knight in the Middle Ages and you're riding out and you're by yourself, don't, first of all, and especially don't ride out where there's a stream or a river in a forest or glade nearby and get off your horse. And if you see a woman, turn and go the other way. Because that's not a woman. <laughs> so, he starts riding and he sees a dance of 24 ladies and more and he goes towards them and they disappear. They're not ladies. They're fairies. Save on the green in the meadow, that is, he sees sitting a woman. Describe this woman. One, uh, excuse me, 999. A fouler wife they may no man devise. You can't imagine a more ugly woman than this. So imagine the ugliest woman you can and then put her on steroids. She's just even uglier. Okay? And she said, Sir Knight, come here. Here forth no life, no way. That is, going in the wrong direction, buddy. There is no way towards this direction. Tell me what you seek by your faith. Peradventure it may the better be. That is, I might be able to help you. These old folk knew much things, said she. That is, us old timers, we've been around. What do you want, buddy? And he says, my dear mother. Why? Because she's like old as earth. Like Mother Earth, Gaia herself, you know. I'm dead, unless I can say what thing it is that women most desire. If you could tell me that, I would repay you. That's what he's saying. You tell me, and I'm yours. I'll do what you want. And she says, plight me thy troth. Get engaged to me. Say you'll marry me. Here, right now. In my hand. Shake my hand. And the next thing that I will require of you, or ask of you, thou shalt it do if it lie in thy might. Yeah, Chaucer is playing on that word, lie. And I will tell it you before it's night time. Okay. Does he mean it? No, he doesn't. He's thinking, ace of spades, get out of jail card. Okay. Then should see, said she, I dare I will boast, thy life is safe, for I will stand thereby. That is, I'm going to tell you the answer, and if I'm wrong, I'll be the one who dies. That's pretty good, you know, pretty good exchange. Upon my life, the queen will say, as I. So let's see. Let's see which is the proudest of them all that wears on a cover a chiff or a call that is a hairnet, that dare say nay of that I shall thee teach. Let's see which of those women says, no, no, that's not it. So they go to the court. And the knight said he had kept this day the promise. Ready was his answer. And for many a noble wife, and many a maid, and many a widow, for they are wise, the queen herself sitting as justice, a symbol been his answer for to hear. That is, it's not just the wives of the knights. It's like all the women in Camelot. They all take a seat at the table. They're all going to agree. That is, if one of them says, uh-uh, that's not it. 
He's toast. All right? Silence is commanded. Why? Because I bet you the knights are sitting there going, well, what is it? They want to know too. And that the knights should tell an audience what thing that women, world, what thing that worldly women love best. Little change there. Earlier was just, what do women love best? What do women want? Now it's worldly women. And he says, my liege lady. Why? Because he is sworn to her as he is sworn to Arthur. 1037. Women desire to have sovereignty as well over their husband as their love and for to be in mastery him above. Mastery. Mastery. Women want sovereignty over their husbands as well as over their love. That is, their bodies. So, I get to tell you what to do, and when I want to be serviced, buddy, you better come and be ready for me. Okay? That's it. This is your greatest desire. Though you kill me. Do as you please. I'm at your will. That's it. That's my answer. He's just waiting, you know, for the arrows to come get him. And in all the court, there was neither wife, nor maid, nor widow that said anything against them. They're like, damn, she actually told them. That's the one thing you're not supposed to tell the men. And with that word, what happens? The ugly old hag starts up, jumps up, and says, mercy, my sovereign lady queen. She's asking Guinevere to show mercy. How? I told him the answer. He promised to marry me. First thing I would told him to require, he would do it if it lay in his might. Therefore, before this whole court, I pray thee, sir knight, that thou take me unto your wife. For well thou know I have kept my life. Fulfill your vow. For well thou know I have kept thy life, and if I say false, nay, say nay upon thy faith. And he's like, alas and well away. Blast and double blast, you know. Why? I, 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 I know I promised that. Yeah, true. But really? I mean, look at me. I'm a knight. I'm handsome. I serve King Arthur. You're an ugly old foul hag. Not very nice, right? He says, no, give it, take, ask for something else. Take all my goods, let my body go. She goes, mm-mm, buddy, nope. I will curse us both. For though that I, notice, she is saying this. I am foul. What else? I am old and I am poor. I desire not for all the metal nor the ore that under the earth is buried or lies above, but that is except I thy wife were and also thy love. That is, and it's not enough for us to just get married. You got to love me. Okay. That is, that marriage has got to be consummated. My love. No, my damnation. That is, if I make love to you, I will go to hell. <laughs> Alas, that any of my nation, and your glass tells you family, because nation implies what? Bloodline. Those you're born from. Okay? You're not to, your nature. That any of my nation should ever so foul disparaged be. How disparaged? How shamed? We never joined with anyone like you. Notice what is the third quality she describes about herself. Poor. She's poor. He's like, hell no, I'm rich. I'm, we don't hang around with low lives. 
The end is this, that he constrained was. Why? Because there's a whole bunch of knights there. And they're like, ah, you got to go through with it. He needs must her wed and take his old wife and go to bed. Now would some men say, peradventure or perhaps, that for my negligence, I do not care to tell you the joy and all the array that at the feast was that same day. That is, they get married, and then what? Well, between the marriage and the wedding night, you have what? A big feast. Festival of sorts. The wife of Bath is saying, hey, let's skip that part. Why? I say there was no joy in her feast at all. There was nothing but heaviness and much sorrow. For privily, he wed her in the morning, and all day after, hid like an owl. Right? Because you don't see owls during the day, unless you're in Harry Potter world. Gets married, he checks out. But, he's found, 1083, Great was the woe the knight had in his thought, when he was with his wife a bed he brought. They kind of march him off to the bed. They march her off to the bed. They close the door, lock it from the outside. His old wife lay smiling evermore and said, Oh, dear husband. Or, Oh, dear husband. Put your teeth in, you know. Benedicity that has blessed you. Fareth every night with thus with his wife as you. Really, is this how all men are with their new wives? Is this the law of King Arthur's house? What is she saying there? He becomes what? A coward. No. I mean, yes, he is a coward. Representative of Arthur. He becomes, he stands for the whole, in other words. Is every knight of Arthur's, that's of his, so dangerous, standoffish? I'm your own love and your wife. I am she which hath saved your life. And certainly, yet not did I you never unright. Not did I never, I think there's another negative in there. I haven't done you wrong. So why are you, notice the word she uses, dangerous, glossed, standoffish. Here's the bed. She's on the bed. Where is he? Yeah, he's back there in that corner. Okay. You act like a man who had lost his wit. What is my guilt? That is, what sin have I done? For God's love, tell it. And if I can, I'll fix it. And he's like... Honey, you can't fix that. Not all the cosmetics in the world can do anything for you. Amended? Nay, it will not be amended. Nevermore. Why? Because you're ugly today, and guess what? Tomorrow, you're going to be a day older. You're going to be uglier more. Thou art so lonely. And so old. And you come from so low a kind. So low a birth. That little wonder is though I wallow and whine. Twist about. Okay. She's old. Can she help that? Well, I mean, within the course of the story, we find out later on. Yes, she can. But can old people help being old? No. Can somebody who's born ugly help being born ugly? Nope. Can somebody who's born to a low family, supposedly, low class, can they help that? Nope. So he's just accused her of three what? Or blamed her for three what? Three things she has absolutely no control over. And she says, that's the problem? That's it? Is this the cause of your unrest? Yeah, no wonder. She goes, well, I can fix all this. 
if I wish to, or, or excuse me, not or, before three days. I could fix all three of those things. I could be so I'm not ugly. I could be so I'm not old. And I could be so that I'm not born of a poor, wrong kind of people. So well you might bear you to me. If you behave properly to me. What's she essentially saying? Stop insulting me. Okay. What else? Stop being whiny. Act like my husband. Act like my husband. And give her sovereignty over him. Give me sovereignty. Approach me properly, slave to slave owner, you know, and I'm being facetious there. And I can fix all these things. And he says, um, excuse me, she says, 1109. And now the wife of Bath is getting to her real point. But because you speak of such gentilessa as is descended out of old riches. What does she mean? Out of old riches. He was born into money. Born into money. She is talking about that kind of riches. What other kind of riches is she talking about? Knighthood. Nobility. Close. Family line. Family line. After all, in politics to that today, the name Kennedy means a little something. The name Sherman, not anymore. It did 200 years ago. You know, Roger Sherman was one of, one of only a handful of people who signed the four original founding documents. Okay? The name Clinton today has a certain cachet to it, depending on one's political party. Okay? The name Bush has a certain little political cachet. If you want to leave the politics realm aside, you could go into business world. The name Carnegie, Vanderbilt, you know, etc. She's saying, you speak of gentileza as though it comes out of old family line. That therefore, you should be a gentleman. That is, if you come from this old line of good people, why aren't you good people? Such arrogance is not worth a hen. Look, who then is most virtuous all, always, always win? Privy, privately, and apart, and most emendeth I to do the gentle deeds that he can. Well, who is that? Your gloss. Look for whoever is always most virtuous in private and in public and always strives to do the most noble deeds. Who does that describe in the general prologue? Two people. The plowman and the parson. The poor parson and his brother the plowman. Because his plowman, does, his plowman brother does what for people without charging them? Carries their dung, cow dung, horse dung, etc. Digs their ditches. Does he do that, do that publicly? Nope. So she goes on. Take him. Take the person who behaves in private. The exact same way he behaves in public. And does so honorably. That is, who doesn't merely put on a show for people. And take that person for the greatest gentleman. Christ desires. What? That we claim of him our gentleness. Honor? Nobility? Yeah, but who's descended from Christ? Unless you're a Dan... What's his last name? Dan Brown. You know, nut. Nobody does. Why? He never had sex with Mary Magdalene. They didn't have children. They're, oh, that's all now. Okay? He doesn't have any physical heirs. So... The kind of gentleness that she's talking about has got to be something else. It's got to be 
spiritual. It has to be moral. Christ desires, we claim of him, our gentilessa. Not from our elders for their old riches. Not from our family line. For though they give us their heritage, for which we claim to be of high parentage, you may not bequeath for nothing to no, no, all those negatives. I mean, they're just piling up. You may not bequeath for nothing to none of us their virtuous living. Who's the there? Those who came before us. See, I can't claim for myself Roger Sherman's virtuous living. Why? Because I'm not Roger Sherman. He lived 300 years ago. 400 years ago. 300 years ago. Okay? I can only claim for myself what? My living. So she says, it's their virtuous living that made them be called gentlemen and bade us follow in such decree. That is, they became what for us? An example. An example. A model. And if we go by the founder's model, boy, have we fallen you know, by the wayside. So, she says, listen to the poet of Florence. Who? Dante. And Chaucer brings Dante in. Lo, in such manner, in this kind of rhyme is Dante's tale, full selled up, riseth by his branches small, prowess of man. You've got a gloss. The excellence of a man seldom extends to the further branches, that is, the sons are seldom worthy of the father. We have a saying that when a child acts an awful lot like his or her parent, what's the saying? Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, chip off the old block, okay? But Dante reverses that and says, not an apple from the tree. That is, you're not acting like your father did or his father, etc. For God of his goodness desires that of him we claim our gentilessa. Well, how can we claim our gentilessa, our honor or our nobility, from God. Back to Jesus, boy. Do what Jesus did, you know. Or, you know, do what so. is written about, you know, in the Gospels, the fruits of the Spirit and all that stuff. For of our elders may we nothing claim but temporal things that man may hurt and maim. What are the temporal things that we can claim from our elders? Mm -hmm. Stuff. Stuff. And what can we do to that stuff? We can hurt it. We can maim it. So, every white knows this as well as I. Everybody knows this. She's kind of saying, I'm preaching to the choir. You know this is true. If gentleness, gentilessa, were planted naturally, that is, by nature, passed on genetically unto a certain lineage down the line, Privy nor part, then would they never find to do of gentle less than a fair office. They might do no villainy or vice. That is, if somebody five generations ago was known as being holy and perfect and all that, then guess what? That person's descendants five generations down would be the same. How do we know it's not? Adam. Well, I had a period the other day, you know, Augustine, the whole original sin stuff. So, she gives an example. Take fire, for example. Take it into the darkest house between here and the, the mountain of the Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains. Where is that? Like in Eastern Europe. It's not even Europe, really. Well, it's kind of. More Southern Russia. It's between the Black and the Caspian Seas, okay? So take fire, put it over there in the darkest house, and let men shut the doors and go away. Yet will the fire as fair blaze and burn, as 20,000 men might it behold. That is, 
If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Yes, it does. It's just there's nothing there to receive it. If you take that fire, lock it in a building, it still blazes and burns, whether or not there's a single person or 20,000 people there to watch it. His office natural, I will it hold. What is the nature of fire? What is its office? Its natural isness. It's to go upwards, right? Up peril of my life till that it die. Here, that is by this image, you may see that gentry is not annexed to possession. It's not linked to possession. If you want. Why? Since folk don't do their operation. That is, they don't behave how? The way they ought. Always, as does the fire, low in his kind. Fire will always do what it does. Okay? For God knows, man may well often find a Lord's son do shame and villainy. I wonder who that's referencing. What 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 did the knight do to get himself in her bed? He raped a beautiful young maiden. That's an act of villainy. I doubt that dad approved of it. Unless he's one of those idiot dads. Well, boys will be boys, you know. Moron. So, the Lord's son do shame and villainy, and he that desires have esteemed for his gentry, for he was born of a gentle house, and had his elders noble and virtuous, and would not himself do no gentle deeds. That is, who thinks, because of where he is born, and who he is born to, he gets the honor of their virtuous deeds applied to him. Huh. No. Nor follows his gentle ancestors ancestor that dead is. He is not gentle. Be he duke or earl. He is not noble. He is not honorable. I don't care whether he's a duke or an earl. Both of which are titles of nobility. Right? So what's she saying? Nobility isn't genetic. You can like William Thatcher in A Knight's Tale, change your stars. How? By behaving nobly. There's a wonderful scene in that film when William has been caught, he's getting ready for the big glass battle, and the bad guy has him arrested because they know he's false, and he gets locked up in the stocks. And he and his friends are, or he's locked up in the stocks, and they're throwing eggs and everything at him. And who shows up? The Black Prince. Edward III, the Black Prince. He goes, you know, there's something about you. There's nobility. Your men love you. You tilt when you shouldn't. Well, what does it mean, you tilt when you shouldn't? You tilted, that is, you jousted against me in a tournament when you knew I was the opponent under a false name. So why shouldn't he joust? Because he's a nobody. And that's the future king of England. Nobodies don't joust against future kings of England. Who does? Future kings of France. <laughs> Equals. You're not my equal. And yet you did it anyways. That is nobility, he says. All right? He is not gentle, be he duke or earl, for a villain's sinful deed makes a troll. No matter how high you are born, if you act villainously, if you act wrongly, immorally, what happens? You might as well be someone who works the dirt all your life. For gentleness is not but renown of thine ancestors for their high bounty, which is a strange thing to, your, to thy person. That is separate from thy person. Thy gentilessa comes from God alone. Then comes our very gentilessa of grace. It was nothing bequeathed us, but it bequeathed to us without our place, or with our place. 
God gives his grace according to what? Not according to your birth. So she goes on and quotes some people. And so 1177, thereas, or since, you of poverty reprove me. That is, you say, I can't love you because you're poor. The high God in whom that we believe in willful poverty chose to live his life. So you can't love me because I'm poor. And yet you say you love Jesus? Oh, Jesus was poor. Okay, so catch on that one. And let's see what else. In certes, every man, maiden or wife, may understand Jesus, heaven's king, would not choose vicious living. Glad or joyful poverty is an honest thing, certainly. Kind of like whom? Oh, I don't know. The parson, the plowman, but not Madame Eglantine, the Mount Priors, who has the gold brooch, who feeds her dogs white bread, that is expensive bread, okay? Not the fat friar, not the summoner, not the partner, She goes on. She quotes Seneca, line 1191. All right, it's up there. She quotes Juvenal. What does this, by the way, tell us about the wife of Bath? She's very well read. Well, keep in mind, her previous five husbands, they all had books. She read them. She didn't like them. She destroyed some of them. Why? Because they told her, Wives obey your husbands. She didn't like that. It ought to be the other way around. Okay, Sydney just indicated. So she goes on and says, uh, da, 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 da. let's see where I can pick up. Yeah, we can go there. Choose now. What is going on? Go away. Go away. Um, choose, lost my place. 1219. Choose now one of these things, to have me foul and old till I die, and be to you a true, humble wife, and never displease you in all my life, or you can have me young and fair, and take your adventure, that is your chance, of the repair that shall be to your house because of me or in some other place, may well be. Now, what she's suggesting there is, Chaucer has several tales that have to do with marriage. They're called the marriage group, okay? And they're about, you know, varying states of marriage. We saw the knights, we talked a little bit about the knight's tale. We have two men in love with a single woman. They fight, one lives, one dies. The one who lives gets to marry the woman. They live happily ever after. It's the Disney version. And then you get the Miller's tale where you have this sexy, lustful young wife who's cheating on her older husband, whose husband knows she's cheating on him and tries to stop her, okay, and has a great practical joke played on him. And then there are a few others where you have young women married to old men or old women married to young men, etc. But in many of them, the implication is if your wife's going to cheat on you, what's going to happen? That door is not going to be like that door anymore. It's going to be like a turnstile. It's going to be a revolving door. Because as one guy leaves, another one's coming in. She said, she's saying here, here are your two choices. One, I will be what? Ugly and old until I die. But I will be true to you, faithful. I will be humble. That is, I will listen to you and do what you say. And I will never, never displease you in all my life. That's option one. Or two, I will be young and beautiful. And you got to take your chances of the repair that shall be to your house. The repair, that's kind of like the path that will, will be worn to your front door by all the men of the neighborhood. 
that will be coming to our door or maybe somewhere else. So choose, which of these do you want? And the knight considers himself and sorely sighs because he thinks, oh man, you idiots. I can't get into bed with that every night, every night, because I'm young. And who, maybe she comes from a family of long livers. Maybe she'll outlive me because he's thinking she's not going to die tomorrow. Or I could have you young and gorgeous, but then you'll cheat on me all the time. And the implication is you won't be humble, you won't be true, and you won't please me in everything. Kind of like rock, hard place. <laughs> but at last he says, My lady and my love and my wife so dear. Why does he now call her his love and wife so dear? And he's just kind of like, I'm stuck with this. Is that it? Is this mere resignation? Is this, to borrow another line from Chaucer, him making a virtue of necessity? Like, hey, you know, I can't stop it, so whatever. She taught him what about this? About nobility, about true gentleness. Being a gentleman has nothing to do with birth. It has everything to do with behavior. So, my lady, my love, my wife so dear, I put me in your wise governance. You choose. In other words, what has she got? Mastery, he's mine. Chooseth yourself which may be most pleasant and most honor to you. Why honor? Because of this. Because of gentleness. To you and me also. Can she bring honor and gentleness to him by being young and sexy? And cheating on him all the time. No, she can't. Can't she bring honor to him by being old and foul and all that kind of stuff? Yes, she can. So he says, I do not care the wither of the two. Now that could be his whatever. I, damn, life sucks. <laughs> it could be that. I don't think it is. For as you liketh, it sufficeth me. She says, then I have, then have I got of you mastery, sovereignty, governance. Why? Since I may choose and govern as I want. That is, I get to choose. He says, yep. You decide. Kiss me. We be no longer wroth, angry. You know, when she says, kiss me, how does she appear? You know, three ears, two eyes, one down here, one up here, horns, you know. However hideously ugly she is, she's hideously ugly. She's like, kiss me. He's like, kiss me. We be no longer wroth. For by my truth, that is, your gloss tells you truth. It's also what? Faith. Fidelity. By my faithfulness to you, I will be to you both. Be to you both what? Old, ugly, foul, young, beautiful, sexy? Can't be both. That is to say, both fear and good. Fair, young, sexy, desirable, and good. The qualities that have nothing to do with looks, nothing to do with age, nothing to do with birth. Everything to do with moral behavior. How does she describe good? I pray to God that I might starve wood or die crazy, but I to you be also good and true. As ever was wife. True, faithful. Since that the world was new, and unless I tomorrow 
be as fair to see as any lady, empress or queen, that is betwixt the east and the west, I do with my life and death right as you please. That is, if tomorrow morning I'm not the most gorgeous woman you've ever seen, then I hope I die. Cast up the curtain. Look how that it is. And when the knight saw verily all this, that she was so fair and so young there too, so why cast up the curtain? Where is she? She's in bed, remember? Where is he? Not. <laughs> Think Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Sir Gowan's in his bed every morning, and the lady comes in, and what does she have to do? She has to pull the curtain back. So she's in bed going, honey, I'm ready. And he's going, hell no. <laughs> and so she delivers this long speech. They're not face to face. So when she says, okay, here's what, here's how it's going to be. Tomorrow morning, if I'm not, he's like, okay. Pulls the curtain back. And what does he see? Not old, foul, and poor. But she was fair and so young there too. For joy, he hint took her in his arms too. His heart bathed in a bath of bliss. A thousand times in a row he gan her kiss. And she obeyed him in everything that might do him pleasance or enjoyment. Kind of like when Sir Gallen said, Kiss? You want to? Sure, I'll kiss you and anything else you want. Oh, help me, Mary. But to hear there's no old help me marry. Why? Because he got what he wants, right? Yeah, he's also married. They're married. And he's given her control. And thus they live into their lives in, in perfect joy. And Jesus Christ send us. Who's the us? Those governors. Who's the us on the it's the pilgrimage, right? How many single women are there? Well, we don't know. <laughs> the nuns, you would hope. <laughs> Send us husbands meek, young, and fresh in bed, you know, energetic, and grace to overbide them, control them, govern them, that we wed. And also, I pray, Jesus, do what? Shorten their lives. Kill them young. That will not be governed by their wives. And old and angry niggards of dispense. God send them soon very pestilence. Okay? Real quickly. Think of the last four lines. What do the last four lines do for the character of the wife of Beth, who was just told, this great tale about true noble behavior, true honorable behavior, true gentleness. It casts her out of it. It ain't her. Because what has she just said? Give me a lusty husband and let him die young. If he's not, what? Governed by his wife. She's saying, yeah, but this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> this applies to others, but not to me. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. So, Middle English exam covers everything in the Middle English period that we've talked about. Um, specifically, passages from Lawn Ball, Sir Gowan of the Green Knight, General Prologue, and The Wife of Bath's Tale. Okay. As well as any of the background stuff, anything that I put on the board, or... Anything in the introduction to this section, which is pages 14 to 39 in the general uh, introduction to the section, and then the introductions to each of the individual works. That will be Thursday. This Thursday or the next Thursday? Thursday. <laughs> this Thursday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 